in our discussion of what is Latin, we talked about the fact that Latin is fairly standardized in the Golden Age period, and all the Latin that comes after is imitating Cicero and other great works from this period. And that has led people from right around the 18 to 1900s in particular, as well as a bit earlier, and certainly in the modern day, to think, oh, well, we should probably pronounce Latin, since this is the, our concentration, we should probably pronounce Latin, certainly Latin and literature of this period, with the pronunciation scheme that is appropriate to it. And Erasmus was the first, I think, modern pioneer of this field of study. So Erasmus, with lots of philological evidence and other pieces of information, including what the ancient grammarians say, set the foundation for what we know today as the restored pronunciation of classical Latin. So there's that. Now, there are two in the world today. There is... There is what we call the classical or restored pronunciation. And then we have what is called the ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical pronunciation of Latin. And these might have different terms, and the other terms might be a little bit better. Like we said, the restored classical pronunciation is the one. And the attempt to reconstruct the pronunciation of Cicero or Caesar, first century BC. Then the ecclesiastical, which is actually, I think, better called the traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin. And that's something that we'll, we'll get to in this discussion. So essentially, it's a bipolar situation, uh, if you will. Not in the psychological sense, but in the sense that there are two poles, much as the earth has two poles. Uh, and the one pole is here. And then the other pole is this thing that we call ecclesiastical uh, pronunciation of Latin. We could call it medieval, we could call it a part of the Italian humanists. So the classical pronunciation, the restored classical pronunciation of Latin is an extremely high fidelity recreation of the pronunciation of this period. And most of the people studying and speaking Latin today do use this one. This would be at least a little bit comparable to using the reconstructed Shakespearean pronunciation of English to perform or understand works of Shakespeare, with the additional fact that people actually speak Latin today with this pronunciation or attempting to reconstruct it as best as they can. So as for the ecclesiastical or Italian pronunciation, this one is based off the traditional Italian pronunciation, which makes sense based on the name. I thought it might be a good idea to give an example of the restored classical pronunciation and then show how the traditional Italian or ecclesiastical pronunciation compares. This is from the War with Catiline by Sallust. First, the restored classical pronunciation. Omnis homines, qui se se student praestare que deris animalibus, summa openiti decet, ne vitan silentio transeant veluti pecora, quae natura pronat que ventrio boedientia finxit. Sed nostro omnis suis in animot corpore citast, animi imperio, corporis servitio, magis ultimur, alterum nobis cum dis, alterum cum belluis commun est. And now, the traditional Italian pronunciation, or the ecclesiastical pronunciation. Omnis homines, qui se se student prestare ceteris animalibus, summo peniti decet, ne vitam silencio transeant veluti pecora, que natura pronat que ventri obediencia finxit. Sed nos omnis vis in animot corpore citast, animi imperio, corporis servitio, magis ultimur, alterum nobis cum dis, alterum cum belluis commun est. So we can see from this brief comparison that the differences between the traditional Italian pronunciation, aka the ecclesiastical pronunciation, and the restored classical pronunciation are extremely few and minor, especially when correct vowel and syllable length is observed. Here is Europe. So what happened? We had the Roman Empire occupying, especially the Western Roman Empire, occupying this rough territory. And the colonists of this empire came predominantly from Italy. And so 
the language that, that was being spoken, some version of vulgar Latin, meaning the people's Latin, not necessarily the educated variant, not necessarily highly influenced either by the educated variant, which we call Latin, spread to all these wonderful places. And as vulgar Latin became Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, other and Romanian, as well as languages like Romansh, Sardinian, Sicilian, and many, many others, Catalan, the language developed into these variants. Latin remains the language of the educated people, as we saw before. There's an unbroken tradition from the classical period of Latin all the way to the present day of people writing and speaking in Latin. But along the way, inhabitants of certain countries have applied their own phonologies, rather artificially, I would say, to the pronunciation of Latin. And as all things that have to do with language change, because they didn't know any better. But that's completely understandable. And I would, don't blame these wonderful older or ancient peoples for the application of their native phonologies. For example, the Spanish phonology. So we can uh, look at the traditional Spanish pronunciation of Latin. Not used very much anymore in most uh, Spanish education of Latin. Most Spanish speakers use the classical restored pronunciation, the restored classical pronunciation of Latin. But there was a traditional pronunciation here, as there was in uh, Portugal, and as there was in, in France, as there was in Germany, and also as there was in England. What's interesting is that the traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin is the one that endures to this day. And that has occurred because of some interesting things that happened. England is an example where I know a little bit more about the details, but in the later part of the 1800s, in Germany, they ended up deciding to go with the classical or the restored pronunciation of Latin in the, we'll just say, I think about the 1890s is around when that became a widespread academic thing. In the UK, apparently debate was very heated because there is a traditional English language pronunciation of Latin, that is native English language speakers pronounce that in a certain way. And that is by far the most different, I think, of any of these particular varieties that I just mentioned. Oh, also it should uh, mention that there is a traditional Polish uh, pronunciation, and there are traditional varieties all over the East as well. Polish for sure, also in uh, Croatia. Uh, these two, I think, are very much the same, if not identical. So all these countries, basically every country, every language there is, there exists also a traditional pronunciation in that area. And I actually don't know too much about the Scandinavian traditional pronunciations. So uh, Daniel Pedersen and Victor Franz and yeah, Johann Vinga let us know what it was like there before the classical restored pronunciation took root. So in the year 1900, about the United Kingdom ended up, uh, after a long debate, going for the uh, restored pronunciation as well, as have pretty much all of these other places. Now, not long after that, very shortly after, I believe it's the year 1903, uh, Pope Pius X, so here we got Rome is right about there. So about 19, I'll just say which, I'll just say 1910 at the latest to be safe, I suppose. About the 19, uh, beginning of the 1900s, we have, uh, we have Pope Pius X establishing the traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin as the standard for the entire Catholic world. And that's how we go from a very different situation. We spoke before about the beautiful variety of Latin that existed after the classical period, late Latin, medieval Latin in particular, and then Renaissance Latin, and then even new Latin. So through all of this time, for in fact, the majority of uh, time, for at least a thousand years, we have very different pronunciations of Latin that are existing next to each other. It is not the bipolar situation we have today. We have nothing resembling a uh, restored classical pronunciation because it didn't exist till Erasmus started talking about it. And we did not have one single eccles ecclesiastical pronunciation. The, so the ecclesiastical pronunciation has been that for 100 years, has been what the Italian pronunciation for 100 years. So what are the differences anyway between our restored classical and ecclesiastical Italian, Italianate pronunciations of Latin? And it's the answer is not terribly much. 
In fact, the prosody and the various characteristics of Italian, which are also present in the way Italians speak with the, uh, their ecclesiastical or traditional Italian way, are exactly the same as restored classical pronunciation. Although many people who learn the restored classical pronunciation are not aware of that, because effectively, in order to achieve that, they have to know Italian. And I do recommend learning Italian as a way to learn about the phonology, at least as a basis of comparison, in Latin. So the distinctions are relatively few. If you have seen my video on the Calabrese system of pronunciation, you'll know that the restored classical pronunciation of Latin only has five vowel qualities, a, e, i, o, u, and they could be short or long. Well, let me get these with the long vowel. So there's a, a, e, e, i, e, o, o, u, u. And that's it. Those are the six vowels. There's also u and u, which are uh, borrowed from, it's a borrowed vowel from Greek. How much actual native speakers use that sound who aren't super educated is a matter of debate. Ecclesiastical Italian, excuse me, ecclesiastical Italian pronunciation of Latin has actually the same vowels, except this one they render to be the same as the E. Now, many claim that the ecclesiastical, the traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin, does not take any account of this distinction. But that's not true, because we have various authors, including Petrarch and many others, who absolutely perfectly use vowel length in their poetry. They do hexameter, they do elegies, exactly like Ovid and Virgil, immaculately. The only way they can do that is if they are capable of pronouncing the language in the most classical, restored way they possibly can. Now, wonderful Latin speakers and teachers like Luigi Miraglia have made the point that he says, for example, Luigi Miraglia, I speak with the ecclesiastical or Italian, traditional Italian, I believe he calls it the traditional Roman pronunciation of Latin, which I think is an interesting uh, way of uh, naming it. The, he speaks in that uh, way because he thinks it helps him, and for the good reason, uh, to the Italian humanists who started this whole revolution in the Renaissance, who connected us with this ancient past. And he has a very good point. And this is used by the Italians, certainly. He goes on in different videos I've seen him giving talks to say that the this is the one that was spread throughout Europe. Yeah, to a degree, but not really, because over in all the way up until the 20th century, all the way until the 20th century in all the rest of Europe, they're not using the Italian pronunciation of Latin. They're using the Spanish, Portuguese, French, German, English ones, and also Polish and Croatian and Romanian and so forth. All of them are being used um, independently of whatever any visiting Italian humanists and educators might be doing in these various cities. Sure, would they copy them? Oh, they might sometimes, but they had their own traditional pronunciations, which were also valid in that time period. So in a way, our Luigi Miraglia, when he says that it's a completely valid pronunciation, absolutely, he's right. And actually, I don't disagree. Those of you who use ecclesiastical pronunciation, I can, although with some difficulty, speak and certainly recite with this pronunciation. I can also use the traditional German pronunciation. And I can make attempts at others, which can be seen in other videos I have done. But the point is that this pronunciation is in no way a universal pronunciation until the year, we'll say, uh, 1910, about 1900, so about 100 years ago. So it's not that old as some kind of international standard. And it has, therefore, although it's been, a, it's been around for a few hundred years, I would argue that it has less currency because the classical pronunciation of Latin, according to the various grammarians I've read, is very consistent. There are some variations they talk about uh, up to this up to this period, the uh, by the fall of the Roman Empire, there's some little things that are different when we know with great certainty that the vulgar language, which is becoming a Romance language, has greatly diverged from whatever the educated classical Latin is supposed to do. But the language we know and we speak is the classical Latin. This is a tradition which goes all the way up until the present. It's the educated language. We're not attempting to recreate the vulgar Latin pronunciation. Which brings me to a point about a significant mistake which is made by some people who use restored classical pronunciation. And that is assuming, uh, this is committed by many great philologists too, so I'm, I'm 
<laughs> I'm uh, punching way above my weight class, as you might say. But one of them being famously Sidney Allen, who is uh, presumed that the short I and the short U are pronounced as with these IPA symbols as I and U, uh, as in the English words uh, hit and look, respectively. Now, I think that's completely wrong. These may have been an intermediate stage, although I doubt it, in the transition from these short I and U of the classical Latin into what they became in, say, Italian, E and O. But not everywhere. By the way, this is not a consistent transition. It's just a fairly common one. So they presume an intermediate stage. Okay, fine. But the intermediate stage is not part of classical Latin. We know this because of Cicero making fun of someone for, well, skipping this step, by the way, but doing this. That is pronouncing E as E. And that is part of several other pieces of evidence, especially the fact that Sardinian, the most conservative, Sardinian, here's Sardinia, the most conservative of all of the Romance languages, retains E and U from the short varieties of Latin, as did uh, languages that exist in Italy today here, as did, as we understand, the African variety of Romance, which of course has since gone extinct. So they have these things in common, and they were colonized at an earlier period, which, and that period happens to coincide with, it happens to coincide with the uh, Plautine and Classical period. So we have a very good, very clear idea of what Latin pronunciation is like in that period. But anyway, that's sort of uh, a minor point, and that's, uh, that's my, <laughs> it's my case to make. The other differences that are notable between the ecclesiastical Italian pronunciation and the restored uh, classical pronunciation is that is uh, not the vowels but the diphthongs so a diphthong are uh, diphthong is two vowel sounds put together that's the traditional understanding of it and the famous Latin ones are I oi and au so the older version of I we see as being I and then we see oi but they transition into this they open up now, eventually, in the vulgar uh, Latin and in the Romance, they become a. Eh. Both of these become a. Eh. They open up to a, eh, an open a eh sound. Uh, in IPA, it looks like this for both. So they merge. They become a. Eh. They, re by the way, retain their long vowel length in attestations throughout the Roman period, through the end of the Roman Empire. Now, what's very interesting is I and oi had become a eh in what's called rustic Latin, and we saw this before, this idea of rustic Latin, which was contemporary with classical and even this stage of Latin. Well, what does rustic Latin mean? We have our little picture of Italy here to look at. So Rome is that little dot right there, or more or less. I think that's pretty close to where Rome is. So Rome is here, but it's in a greater region, which is called Latium. And the Latium people speak Latin. They all speak different dialects of Latin. And the specific dialect that we call Latin is the most conservative variety, the Roman Latin, the original classical Roman Latin. It's more conservative. In that dialect, uh, all the way through the classical period and through uh, much of the Roman Empire, they retained the pronunciations of I and oi. They hadn't opened to e, which is what they had in other parts of Latium and in the other Italic languages like Umbrian, uh, Umbrian rather, and Oscan, where they had opened up to e. So many common people, uneducated people, who didn't speak what we consider to be proper Latin, good Latin, the Latin that we speak today, were pronouncing I and oi as a. They were making that transition. What's interesting is, of course, that's how it ends up dominating. This opening of the I and oi to a has been consistent in some form or another in the entirety of the Romance languages. So this transition absolutely happened, and it happened broadly. And it happened prior even to what we can call classical Latin in the old Latin period, but not in the dialect spoken in the city of Rome. That urbane dialect, the urban elite dialect, is the one that we still use. That's the language that we use. And this is where the contrast comes in. And this is why I think it's an interesting question. Ecclesiastical, uh, or the Italian sort of pronunciation of uh, the traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin, is basically just what they had in Italy by the Renaissance period, and even before medieval period, Renaissance period. But many people, including Erasmus, they were rediscovering the vowel lengths 
Of course, they, those vowel lengths were known throughout the Middle Ages, but they knew them really well by this point, up to the present day where we know them perfectly, including hidden quantity, with probably zero errors. Men and scholars like Luigi Miraglia say, well, this is the pronunciation I use because that's continuity back 500 plus years. And definitely has a point, can't argue with that, can't argue with the meaning that it has for him or for other people who enjoy this pronunciation. Those of you who may be listening now, use it, enjoy it. Fantastic. I'm happy that you're speaking Latin. But this does not have greater validity than classical Latin in this entire tradition. Nor can the ecclesiastical Italian pronunciation of Latin stand for the various pronunciations in the New Latin period. Did Newton speak with that one? Psh, no, he spoke with the traditional English one, which to me is incomprehensible, frankly. But it's, uh, that's what he used. And then there's uh, the Poles who are using their version. And we have other Renaissance people, Germans and the French, and they all have are using their own traditional ones, and we can estimate how they pronounce in these various periods. But using the Italian one for all of these peoples, for all of this, uh, okay, I mean, you can, sure, if you want to speak that literature with the Italian pronunciation, but that's only this country's version of Latin from the, say, Middle Ages to the uh, present, at least to the 20th century. Whereas all of the other uh, countries have something different. And now they've all standardized in most of their speakers to the classical pronunciation. And by the way, this is not a fight. Well, it's not a fight at all, I don't think. Nor could it be a fight if it were a fight over superiority, dominance on those sorts of things. Like uh, we could say that, well, there is more people who use the restored pronunciation. And therefore, it's the right one. No, that's a specious argument. That's the... What is that called? That fallacy of the mob, the reason that Socrates got murdered, but legally, you know, that kind of thing. That's that's not um, a logical argument. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. And the same token, just because the Catholic Church about 100 years ago said that the Italian one would be the standard for communication, doesn't mean that uh, people using the language in the Catholic Church couldn't use the classical restored one. In fact, more and more and more, I am seeing people who are members of the clergy using and learning the classical restored pronunciation for the reason that I'm making here is that we have a language which is founded, founded, I suppose. It's, its foundation or its core as we respect it today is here. This is where it's standardized. Some people say fossilized, some people say died, whatever. The point is that this is where the language comes from, especially the golden silver age, the classical Latin. And therefore everything after it is an attempt to imitate it. And here we have a complete reversal of the various barbarisms and mutations and alterations and vulgarisms that occurred. Vulgarism meaning again, folk, not the not meaning obscene, phrase vulgarisms and barbarisms were mostly entirely cleaned out in the Renaissance period, the New Latin period, and especially contemporary Latin, which is why since 1900, we see this complete resurgence and almost complete takeover in most parts of the, at least of Europe and of other parts of the world of the classical restored pronunciation. Again, this does not invalidate at all, I don't think the usage of the ecclesiastical Italian pronunciation for whatever one wants. It's beautiful, and the way the Italians speak, whether it's Latin or Italian, or if they're speaking uh, this pronunciation or that, doesn't matter, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. I love it. I'm an Italophile, of course, but uh, many of us who end up learning Latin end up being that way anyway. Some argue that the traditional Italian pronunciation at least shows some kind of natural evolution or progression of the language into something kind of like the modern languages. Well, this is incorrect uh, for many reasons. One is that Latin is a highly standardized non-native language to anybody. So speaking of naturalness is not an especially, um, is not making an especially strong argument, I believe. So, okay, that's the one. And the other is that the ecclesiastical Italian pronunciation of Latin doesn't at all represent the natural evolution of the language. In some respects, yes. In some respects, not at all. And this is a big one, that owl in ecclesiastical is still owl. It's still owl with, uh, here it is with my best attempt at IPA with my marker. It's still owl with no distinction. That is, this is the same between the two, but that's not correct as far as the natural progression. In the old Latin period, 
in the common, in the uh, rustic forms of Latin, we even see that owl is already all. It's already a long o sound. And various hypercorrections occurred. It's very interesting, the dynamic between the rustic Latin speakers, the vulgar Latin, well, not just vulgar Latin, vulgar Latin is more like grammar, usage, vocabulary. Rustic Latin is related to that, and I would isolate rustic Latin to be mostly Latiums, people in Latium who aren't Romans, who speak the farmer kind of Latin, but they're native speakers. In any case, they show these kinds of developments. They show the development um, of Awo to O, and we have anecdotes, which are uh, which the wonderful Sidney Allen also comments in his Walks Latina. We have uh, testimonies of various hypercorrections, which is interesting. For example, we have the hypercorrection, which is sadly rather standard today, of skyna. But skyna from comes from the Greek word skene. It comes. This is in transliterate. Let me write this in more uh, Roman letters. Skene, or in the more Western type of Greek would be skena. Anyway, the point is that this is long e. Why do they make it skena? It's a hypercorrection. It's a hypercorrection which I don't say. When I speak Latin, I say skena, and I write skena, because that's the word. It's from Greek. Skena is an interesting and somewhat bizarre hypercorrection. There's another one like that, which is the, the word um, uh, applause, uh, which is... So the word plaudere, which is the standard term which is taught to this day, is actually incorrect. It's really plaudere, plaudere. But in hearing uh, this all, Romans who were of the upper crest, who weren't that well educated, you know, they were in educated circles, but they ended up hypercorrecting plaudere, the plaudere, because they're like, oh, you're some rustic type. You can't pronounce the au. It's actually plaudere. There's an anecdote that Sidney Allen tells in Vox Latina of uh, someone, uh, someone to, uh, called F Florus, the guy's name was Florus, and he was telling another gentleman that, oh, it's not Plaudere, it's Plaudere. So the next day, the guy called Florus, Flaurus, to make fun of him. Oh, Flaure! <laughs> uh, it's a distinction that gets lost in these uh, rustic variety. People who don't speak the language, the let's say the Roman urban version of the language, Natively, they speak a dialect of it outside of the city of Rome or something else from Italy, like the Oscan or Umbrian. And my point is that in the Romance languages, owl becomes all. It does not stay owl. So why on earth does the Italian pronunciation of Latin pronounce owl as owl? Well, it's a kind of strange mistake. It's an odd kind of hypercorrection because owl should be pronounced all in Latin uh, just as as the I'll take the ablative form uh, so laude is Latin for by means of praise laude and it should be pronounced sorry it's supposed to be an O it should be pronounced laude let me write that again it's not messed up it should be pronounced laude which is in fact the Italian word laude and yet it's pronounced laude well that's technically a weird hypercorrection. I would call it a mistake. It's not consistent. At the very least, it doesn't show some kind of natural progression of vulgar Latin or something because vulgar Latin, really, it's a separate thing. We talked about the uh, diglossia. The vulgar Latin underneath all of this literature is developing separately in its own direction into romance. And then for some reason, the rules of the romance languages, in this case, Italian, are applied the morpho mor morphological changes are applied arbitrarily. Anyway, I just think it's really weird. Um, other ones that are completely inconsistent and uh, is that, well, H is not pronounced as an H in almost all positions in ecclesiastical or traditional Italian Latin. Well, that's fine. Even in the classical period, it was very weak and often not pronounced in certain positions. That's completely, uh, I'm okay with it being totally silent. That doesn't bother me very much. But also final M needs to be completely silent, yet it's not. Final M is a nasal, uh, is the nasalization of the preceding vowel in classical restored pronunciation of Latin and the Latin of, well, actually all of this Latin, all the way from Old Latin through the until the fall of the Roman Empire. It's only after this point that people see an M and like, oh, I need to pronounce the M. No, that's um, 
hypercorrection. But so be it, it's a hypercorrection. So if ecclesiastical or traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin were somehow loyal to the various phonological changes which happened to the Latin language, then they wouldn't pronounce the final M at all. It would be silent. They would pronounce the uh, the A-U as O, as they pronounce A-E as A and O-E as A. Um, that has currency. Now, when I speak Latin, once in a while I do this because I say, uh, for example, lautus. There's also the word lautus, which is attested in writing lots of places, which is like, it's like saying awesome or cool or fancy or shiny. You know, it's just, instead of saying lautus, that's more like, oh, that's charming or fancy. But lautus is more of a the um, folkish way of saying it. So I, I do that once in a while because I'm imitating the commoner or the more slangy version. That's actually a better way to say it. I'm imitating the slangy version of the language from the very same classical Latin period. The traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin has some other things like T-I-A and other T-I has uh, it's pronounced T-S, like a T-S-I-A, um, uh, T-S-I-A or something like that as an equivalent. And that's fine. You know, those, those things happen. Basically, the point is that the traditional uh, ecclesiastical, rather the uh, traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin or, ecclesi or ecclesiastical pronunciation of Latin, including the pronunciation of V, as it is in, rather it should be a W sound in the classical version, and yet pronounced as a straight and good old Italian V. Well, yeah, it became that, but maybe probably not during the Roman period and not in the educated circles. It was more likely, if anything, even in the educated circles, it might have been the V, which is a sound which we find in Spanish, but to be that already, nah, maybe. <laughs> Not a lot of strong evidence for that. So anyway, the argument that is sometimes made that the traditional Italian pronunciation of Latin is somehow more natural is completely false. It is far, far more artificial than the restored classical pronunciation of Latin. Because speaking Latin, using it as an instrument of education is, by the way, extremely artificial. And that's okay. Because we go through lots of artifice, lots of training in our lives in our own native language. Vocabulary, pronunciation, diction. As little kids, we learned it's not me am, it's I am, for example, as English speakers. We learn these things from our parents, from our teachers, from our peers, and we learn that there's a proper way to speak the language. There's lots of artificialness which goes into our so-called natural or native languages. So learning a foreign language like Latin certainly requires us to do something artificial, but we might as well aim for something that is natural. So anyway, what is my point in all this? The most important point I have with all the pronunciation is actually, I think, unifying. And that's the fact that we have uh, very consistently that the most educated speakers of Latin in all periods, as well as many uneducated ones from earlier, consistently distinguish long and short vowels correctly. And this has been seen as well, of course, more recently uh, with more modern authors, writers, poets, and speakers of Latin. They do this extremely well. And the seeds for this are seen as early as the 1300s with Petrarch. And also in uh, some very few medieval poetry. They understand that there is a syllable length distinction and they seek to retain it. So it is, although extremely tenuous in this period, a tradition that's passed on. So that's something that needs to be consistent. Uh, Italians pronouncing Latin in the traditional Italian way, or anyone doing it that way, even though you may have been told that the long and short vowels are not a part of the pronunciation system, they are, they're just widely disrespected. But they're almost equally widely disrespected by speakers who are using the best they can the restored classical pronunciation. Just because they haven't really heard it before, um, distinct phonemic vowel length, is not part of the following countries, languages. Portugal, Spain, France, anywhere in the UK, uh, Germany, there's a couple, there's, there's some in Germany, but not very clearly, and almost pretty much nowhere in Italy, Poland, no, Croatia, yes, and Romania, no. So basically all of these places don't clearly distinguish phonemic vowel length anymore. And these, yet these are the most of the various um, native language speakers. Uh, Americans and Australians and other people who speak English outside of the UK, of course, who are speaking Latin and reciting Latin today. So it's not that I understand why it's hard. I get it, everyone. I get why doing this consistently is challenging. 
But this is the core of the Latin language. And the literature, I can tell you, the poetry cannot be appreciated or understood truly. The music of it is not understandable without this being very important. So I'll talk more about uh, pronunciation in another video. I suppose uh, we should end with a question, as we asked many questions in our previous video. And that has to do with the, I mean, there's consistency. We talked about bipolarity. Um, it's interesting because these two poles, if they have any geographical resonance, both of them are here. One in Rome of the present, one in Rome of the past. In fact, it's very interesting because when we learn, um, those of you who are Europeans, for example, and don't speak English as a first language, and yet you can understand my rambling, that's really impressive, good for you, you had to choose one of the two standard dialects, or maybe it wasn't chosen for you, maybe your teacher was a native speaker from the UK or from Ireland or Scotland or from Australia or New Zealand or America or Canada or India or anywhere else I might have forgotten where English is a mother tongue. And uh, in any case, maybe you did choose a pronunciation. I remember when I was in high school and I had German exchange students, they told me, uh, 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 we learned the, the British English, you know, slightly British, slightly German, which is the most adorable accent you've ever heard. It was wonderful. And, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah fine. You know, I accept it. I accept it even more today. In fact, if I had to pick one standard pronunciation for English in the world, yeah, I would pick the received pronunciation of London, England, of the... Um, of the of the more common version of the Queen's English as the pronunciation that every foreigner learns in front of my own general American pronunciation. I think that's completely reasonable. But if you pick American, I mean, there's 370 million of us and uh, a lot of us speak the same way, unlike most of the Englishmen and other people in this part of the world, whether in Ireland or in Northern Ireland or Scotland or Wales or, or England, anywhere in the, in the UK or in Ireland, <clears throat> I think I've, if I covered that politically well enough, <laughs> I'm sorry, anyone, <laughs> I might have offended getting through that. Um, native speakers of English in this part of the world, uh, they speak variously and very differently. And I think Americans speak generally more in the same way. So I can understand why Europeans more and more and more are learning the American way to pronounce English as a standard. Okay, that's a, fine. You know, I can't argue with it, even though I would... RP as an international standard. RP, by the way, is the received pronunciation, uh, which is the standard pronunciation spoken natively only by 2%, as I've understood inhabitants of the UK. And of course, the loveliest variety of all of English is the Irish, in my opinion. So this is the question. We have to pick, as speakers of Latin, a pronunciation not just, interestingly, not just of geography, whereas people from Europe can pick uh, ge geographically American, geographically Irish, geographically Scottish English, or uh, English English, or Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. All those are choices that these people can make geographically. We have a choice that is not, in fact, a geographic choice. It's entirely a choice in time. And it's all in this one place. The two poles are right there. You have the... Uh, restored classical one, and you have the traditional Italian one, and they're right next to each other in the same location in the same city, but they're separated by time by, I think, something that is even more daunting than geography. Uh, so what I suppose I'm asking, and this is rhetorical, as I've said, Latin should continue as a spoken language used as an instrument by people to speak. It will continue. It will continue, just kind of neat, those of us who know it. We get the comfort of knowing all things remaining same in this world, Latin will continue virtually unchanged long after we're gone. It's pretty cool. So the things that we say and we write in Latin today will be understandable to people, say Latin gets to be a part of study, maybe studied by people living on Mars in 500 years, and they'll learn the exact same language. But what pronunciation will they learn? Well, probably it'll be something more like the classical one if I had to guess. Uh, my observation is that the traditional Italian pronunciation is probably on its way out in the next hundred years or so, perhaps by social pressure or something like that. Now, I don't think that's a good reason. I don't think social pressure or this is a majority is a good reason. But it is interesting for us as teachers to ask this question. Now, if you take my advice on the vowel length thing, 
I think it doesn't really matter at all. Because if you have the vowel length and the right syllable length, because uh, Italians, much better than most speakers of restored classical pronunciation, are able to do double consonants correctly. They can distinguish anus and anus and anus. Well, actually, they can't distinguish the last two because those are vowel length differences. But they can distinguish anus and anus very well, as they can in their native Italian. Uh, other speakers who try to do ecclesiastical who don't know Italian don't always do that so well. Other people, say uh, Americans, Germans, uh, who learn the restored classical pronunciation don't observe this, or consonant length, the geminated consonants, the double consonants, very well, which makes, frankly, it makes it very difficult for me to understand them. Um, but more than that, it's an important part of the language. So if we take the ideal parts of, of the pronunciation of Latin as one thing, and I, it's possible by now I've alienated everyone. <laughs> and if so, I apologize, but um, that's sort of the, the question. I, get, I don't think it really comes with an answer. I lean towards the classical one uh, because it seems... It is the language that we're seeking to emulate, as always, emulating Cicero, above all. We're always aiming for that. And thus, a pronunciation system, which is based off of his way of speaking, is reasonable. And also, I would say, absolutely vital to comprehending the poetry and the prose of this period. But not only this period, but also things from this period on. And also in between, depending on where you're looking. You'll find them once in a while. So that's my opinion. What do you feel about the situation? All opinions are welcome in the comments below. Just be respectful to people if you're responding to them. Or uh, please be gentle to me. I won't ask you to be respectful per se, but please be gentle if you have harsh criticism. But all opinions are welcome here. And uh, thank you for listening to my ramblings about Latin. Lude vamos amore facili. At non quolo modo che lari, o if se credo in occhi, curne.